My father, a Vietnam veteran, along with countless others, bravely answered the call of duty and served our country with unwavering commitment and courage. Their sacrifices and experiences have left an indelible mark on our nation's history. The Vietnam War was a challenging and tumultuous time, and those who served endured hardships that many of us can never fully comprehend. In the face of adversity, they displayed resilience, dedication, and a deep sense of loyalty to their fellow soldiers and to our country. Despite the challenges and controversies surrounding the war, the valor of these veterans remains unquestionable. Their sacrifices, both seen and unseen, have left lasting impacts on their lives and the lives of those around them. It is important that we as a community respect and honor the service of our Vietnam veterans. Their stories, experiences and contributions should never be forgotten. We must continue to support and advocate for the well-being of these brave individuals, ensuring that they receive the recognition, care and respect they deserve. Let us pay tribute to all Vietnam veterans and express our gratitude for their selfless service. May we never forget the sacrifices that they made and their enduring legacy of their service to our country. I had no real understanding of why we, Australia was involved, uh, why we were there. Well, I first heard about it in my third year as an Army apprentice um, at the Army Apprentice School. One morning when our company sergeant major came in and said, we're starting to send people to Vietnam. National service came along at, uh, when I was about 19. Uh, we all had to register, all 20 year olds at a certain date, had to register uh, and it was done by ballot. They pulled a, a, a ball by date out of the barrel. Uh, my number came up. I was a national serviceman. I was one of the 173 numbers. Um, and and I, I, I really learned to be proud of that uh, because the national servicemen that came in were really a, a fairly clever lot, I think. You got a call, you got a letter saying, uh, report, in my case, to Swan Barracks in Richmond uh, on a certain date with a little dilly bag and uh, get ready to go to Puckapunyal. That course was the one good thing that came out of it for me because it was uh, the best management course, I, you know, the six months intense study you did to become a second lieutenant. Uh, when you graduated, you, you received your commission. You felt like you'd earned it. Remember these scenes two years ago as Australia's first national servicemen prepared for their introduction to army life? Many were to be posted to the 5th Battalion after their basic training. and a grimace at their first army inoculation. So I went with the, the first major group that went to Vietnam. There was a handful of advisors there uh, before us, but I went with the first major group, the first battalion. And uh, we learned about Vietnam on the ship going over there. My expectations arriving in Vietnam were obviously like the rest of my mates, all willy-nilly here, there and everywhere. We uh, got into an LCM, which is uh, a watercraft with a door that folds down at the front off the HMAS Sydney. We landed on the beach in Vung Tau with a sausage bag with all our gear in it, but with no bullets and with no ammunition. They had to set up a camp on the beach 
which now, then became the Australian Logistics Support Base, and which grew and grew and grew. Um, so we stayed there, I think, for about two weeks, um, establishing the, uh, the base. Well, one of the things that got me especially was uh, looking out of the plane coming into land and that we saw rice paddies everywhere. And we'd never seen rice paddies in our lives before, but we soon got used to them. I saw all these people with guns and stuff and I thought, oh no, it's getting serious here. And all these choppers coming back and landing right next to where we stopped with, with guns, smoke coming off them, like just being fired. And we just looked at each other and uh, we were then ushered into our hangar, our own hangar, and briefed immediately. We generally got in there fairly early in the morning when it was still dark. And then all the action started with uh, unloading all our uh, vehicles and uh, stores and everything else. And uh, then bringing all the army on board and uh, bring back whatever machinery, trucks, whatever that was no longer needed in Vietnam. My role in a infantry battalion was that I was a part of a mortar crew, which is a three-man crew, and uh, we would be the indirect fire support for any of the company, the rifle companies in the battalion whilst on operation. And even in our defensive position at um, Benoit Air Base, uh, we were ready to fire at any targets or any anything that was to attack us to the front because our role there was to protect the airfield which was the second biggest airfield in South Vietnam and we had uh, if you look to our rear we could see at least a hundred fighter bombers smaller bombers 200 helicopters, gunships, uh, numerous aircraft. Uh, and if your people know what Hercules or C-130 aircraft, there was them, they were going in and out of the place all day, every day. So our role in our portion of the perimeter was to protect. And our role as a mortarman was to give indirect fire to our rifle companies once they were operating to our front. Initially, I, I was what they call a rifleman in, um, in a section in the D Company Fire Area. Uh, riflemen are just riflemen. Uh, they're the ones who uh, patrol. We were constantly patrolling, constantly patrolling. Um, uh, we, had, we, along with 6 RAR, had to establish the, what became the Australian Task Force Headquarters, the base in Nui Dat, and we had to clear the enemy from that area uh, because they were there, uh, the, the bad guys were there. Uh, and we did that in conjunction with the 173rd Airborne Division, from, which is American Division. Uh, they were there as we arrived. The difference was that we were one battalion in an American brigade. Uh, we were part of the 173rd Airborne Parachute Brigade and we were one battalion, so we had entirely different working conditions, uh, working tactics, that sort of thing, to the Americans. Uh, we depended, for instance, on going out on a patrol and staying out for six, day, uh, six days to six weeks, uh, carrying minimal rations, uh, not cleaning our teeth because the Viet Cong could smell that, so you'd go six weeks, not washing or changing clothes, uh, where the Americans depended on a helicopter dropping in every day to drop in rations and resupplies and that sort of thing, which automatically gave your position away. Uh, I don't say that they were any better or any worse, it was just a different form of tactics that we used. We were used to the Malaysian counter-terrorism where you'd blend into the jungle and not be seen for a while, uh, and that was the best way to, to ambush someone because they didn't know you were there. But if you were taking a helicopter resupply every day, people knew exactly where that helicopter was landing and taking off from. Three or four nights a week you'd be on patrol or out in the wire at the outpost there that have got to be manned at the night time. And 
I know a lot of the boys have done it pretty hard, but it used to get a bit harrowing out there too. You'd be staring at something long enough, like it had uh, glow, glow flies, and uh, you stare them at, at them long enough that you just look like someone out there sucking on a cigarette and it blows up. And you think there's bloody thousands of them out there. My job eventually, uh, I got out of the truck and uh, at eight stone four, I was given an M60 and I was on the back of a Land Rover gun jeep, um, hanging onto that M6, M60 that uh, used to uh, look after the rear of the convoys that took us to places like Long Bin, Nui Dat, the Battle of Coral Balmoral. The Battle of Coral Balmoral was the biggest battle during the Vietnam War. There were more losses. Um, the 13th of May 1968 was the big battle where they were overrun. On that night, that uh, battalion headquarters, mortars and others were nearly overrun by the Vietnamese. It was very touch and go. Coral Balmoral was really higgledy piggledy because we were not properly entrenched to fight anyone when we first got there. So there was bedlam everywhere. Everything was happening all over the place and orders were being shouted from the corporals right up to the captains and, and majors and what have you. So it was just a matter of listening uh, and acting on orders that were given by whoever. We weren't in a trench. We didn't have time to dig any trenches or anything. Uh, if anything, we had to uh, just dig shell scrapes, just something for a little bit of protection or get down behind something. One thing I do remember vividly is laying on my back, looking at the sky and trying to make pictures out of the tracer bullets that were flying up and around us all over the place. Um, that was taking my mind off a lot of the fear that I probably had. But that's the one thing that Coral Balmoral with me always takes my mind to, what did I do there when people ask? Yep, I watched the tracers and tried to make pictures out of the traces that were flying above and all around me. Tony was, uh, well, he was a rifleman. I, I, I couldn't tell you on that day because he never, never said anything about it other than I know that the 13th was really bad and coming up to that time every year is really hard for him still. I used to go out on We'd go out and do a clinic in a village. And and I I went out on, on some of these because I just wanted to see. But we weren't really we weren't really wanted. You could tell that. Um, and I remember we had our our we had a a regular soldier who who came out on these clinics with us, a Vietnamese guy who would act as the interpreter. And as we were leaving this day, we drove off and a whole bunch of kids ran after us. And I said to him, they're yelling at us, what are they saying? He said, you don't want to know. And uh, anyway, eventually he said, they're saying you come back again and we'll kill you. And I thought, do we know what we're doing? <laughs> This, this, this was always the great contradiction of Vietnam. I think what affected him the most that I got from his letters was the children that were over there were the same age as what our children were and he saw the destruction of, of the families and um, he kept saying, you know, he couldn't wait to get home to, to the family again and I think that was what he was thinking when he saw these children that his own children and he was happy that they were safe 
um, he, he used to say, um, we have to keep our country safe. Remember, we're only six hours by plane away. And I think that's how it affected him, that he would, the war would come to our country and that's what they were trying to stop, that they didn't want that to come and interfere with our lives. One of his jobs was to search the bodies and he found, because we had a daughter, a young daughter then, and he had to search the body of a young guy who had a photo of a woman and a little girl in his, in his pocket. And that stayed with Tony. That was, that was the worst part, I think, for him, to see that and think that could have been me. I stood up on that little, on top of this rock, on top of that little rise, with an M16 pointed at this guy and beckoned for him to put his hands in the air. And he fired one of those RPGs at me, which blew me into the air. <laughs> How it was, or wasn't hurt by, I've got no idea, but came tumbling down again and jumped up and he was scarpering off down the track and I fired a whole magazine of M16 at him and I don't think anything went within 20 metres of him. I was a bit shaken up. And so I went racing back to my vehicle and uh, picked up the handset to say that we were in contact um, and uh, Task Force Headquarters called me and said, are you alone? And I said, I looked, it was only my near soldiers. And I said, yes, and he said, your father's dead. Hard to swallow. We would write letters and um, we were hoping that they would get back as soon as they can. I think it was, if I remember, it was probably a three week turnaround if you wrote a letter and it went back to Australia and we got one back again. Connections with family are very important and I've still got letters from, from uh, uh, family, brothers, sisters, you know, cousins, girlfriends, boyfriends, all this sort of thing. Uh, the guys and girls I used to mix with. Now it's important, you know, the fact that you know, uh, the Americans call it mail corp. I don't know what we call it, but uh, a mile's in. Uh, so the platoon sergeant, uh, who was a fellow called Bobby Armitage, who was a great guy, he, uh, he would, he'd tease us and say, who's got mail, who's got mail? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it became a bit, of a bit of the pantomime of the whole thing. But most of the guys regularly got mail. Perhaps some people see their children growing up by photographs. He was wanting to know our, how we changed on a day-to-day -day basis through you know, asking questions of mum, so of course then she would write back to him. My hero, you're so brave. I know that you will win this war. You will not be its slave. You know your family loves you. We're here to help you through. We'll always stand beside you, no matter what you do. Emerging from a fog-shrouded Sydney harbour, the troop carrier HMAS Sydney prepares to berth at Garden Island Dockyard. And with her comes the main contingent of the 5th Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, after service in the battlefields of Vietnam. But there are some who believe Australia should not be there. And as these demonstrators marched in Martin Place, we asked them why they were marching. I knew around us, for the, uh, this was in 67, the developing anti-war campaign, uh, the Save Our Sons. An interesting point, the guys I went to Vietnam, predominantly national servicemen, did not want to be saved. They wanted to go to Vietnam. Bear in mind, it was 20 years after World War II. Their fathers had been soldiers. You know, they understood what it was all about. Uh, so the, you know, unfortunately, those sort of campaigns captured the narrative uh, and captured the universities and whatever. I have a friend of mine who, uh, who came back and did not tell anyone where he had been for two years. He went to university, they did not tell anyone because of the feeling at the university. Now, that shouldn't happen in Australia. That should not happen. When we marched through Sydney to be thanked for the job that we'd done, 
we had that person throw red paint over our commanding officer and threw the other people um, who were up in the front ranks, some of the senior officers. Um, at that time, I got red paint on my boots. But the police said to us while we were marching, leave the protester to us, we will fix it. So uh, that was our first take from these people who were anti. From then on, I had a role that I was uh, the guard sergeant at the Cenotaph at Martin Place. And every time we went down there, there was protesters. We were told we were baby killers, we were this, we were that. And it made very hard to say, we're Australians and you're Australian. You know, go and read the truth. Don't, don't make up these stories. And, and uh, that was hard to, it was just hard to take that, that the people just didn't like us for, for us doing a job to protect our country. For somebody to be put in that position, it's a national decision, uh, whether you like it or you don't like it, it's, it's, it's what you've got to do. And I think, I don't think it's right that people could go and spit or splash blood or splash red paint or whatever. That's a horrible thing to do. My outlook on life after I returned home uh, was changed to say the least. I do feel for the poor old National Servicemen who did superb jobs, but then got out and went back to little rural communities and were not accepted in a lot of cases right, because they had a hard time. When we came back in 72, yes, there was a fair bit of agitation, if you like. Uh, there was a lot of, although I never experienced it myself, uh, a lot of um, a lot of rubbish put on the on the diggers by the RSL. Some some people sort of uh, uh, put you down a bit because uh, oh you've been to Vietnam and all like that and you know they thought we were idiots. Particular older members say Second World War, Korean War uh, members. So, you know, it wasn't a real war. Like World War I and World War II. People didn't get blown up with bombs and stuff. And uh, we did. 300 and something Australian army people didn't come home. Right? So we were told that it was an assistance and not a real war. We got angry. And we said, how dead do you have to be to be real? We haven't kept in touch with, with many veterans. Because of Tony's PTSD, we used to go to, um, to reunions and the last one that we went to, he really, my words are he falls out of his tree when his PTSD is really bad. Anyway, just, he was always very reluctant to talk to guys in case they wanted to talk about the war, which he never ever would. So he, he was advised then by his psychiatrist not to go to any more reunions because it was just too hard for him. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress when I was 47, but that amounted to not only what things had happened during my life following the, in Vietnam, following Vietnam, serving in Malaysia and so forth at 47. And I didn't know what it was. The medical people could see that, uh, and the terminology that I think is used as flashbacks, is that as soon as you start talking to someone about an incident, uh, the emotions build up and uh, you've got people, and I'll put my hand up to this, I would start crying and I just couldn't control it because of something that I've triggered in a conversation Every now and then, certainly, it would come back to me, mainly in sleep. 
um, but slowly but surely um, things changed like walking through Rundle Street in Adelaide with my mate um, who was in Vietnam as well uh, a car backfired and, and we sort of trembled and, and looked at each other and, and, and then went, oh, you idiot. Um, things like that for a little bit did uh, play a role in uh, us thinking about Vietnam. I enjoyed the military. I did enjoy the military. I enjoyed the mateship. I enjoyed the comradeship. Uh, when I lost my wife uh, and I had three young children, uh, I was just amazed at how mateship works and how well I was looked after and that sort of thing. So I never felt that I had something I owed the military, but uh, I really was very much part of that family. Well, the two tours were the most intense years and exciting years uh, of my service. I've probably been more at peace lately than in a sense, or acceptive, that's not the word. I'm more acceptive of some of this. Um, however, you're not sure, you're not, in, you're not sure. It's um, it's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to piece things together. I think back, and I thank my lucky stars for coming home. But on the same token, I never, at any stage of my time in Vietnam, felt that I wouldn't go home. My last words to him before he got on the helicopter to be taken down there was, uh, you look after yourself down there and take care, don't get yourself hurt down there, young man. About an hour and a half later, he was dead. And uh, he, that tank hit a, a mine again and uh, he was killed instantly. So, very sad. And every time I go to this Australian War Memorial, I put a little pop in by his day. <laughs> They made the ultimate sacrifice and they did it for a big, because they believed in what they were doing was right. You know, and we thank them for, for their service. As you remember them with smiles on their faces and, and that's, that's the best memory that you can have about those people that never come home. They come home, but it, but it took them a long time. The Brotherhood. I know why men who have been to war yearn to reunite. Not tell stories or look at old pictures. Not to laugh or to weep. Comrades gather because they long to be with men who once acted at their best. Men who suffered and sacrificed. Men who were stripped of their humanity. I did not pick these men. They were delivered by fate and the military. But I know them in a way I know no other men. I have never given anyone such trust. They were willing to guard something more precious than my life. They would have carried my reputation, the memory of me. It was part of the bargain we all made, the reason we were so willing to die for one another. As long as I have my memory, I will think of them all every day. I'm sure that when I leave this world, my last thought will be of my family and my comrades. Such good men.
Emerging from a fog-shrouded Sydney harbour, the troop carrier HMAS Sydney prepares to berth at Garden Island Dockyard. And with her comes the main contingent of the 5th Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, after service in the battlefields of Vietnam. Waiting on the dockside, relatives and friends who've waited alone for the past year for their loved ones to return to their homeland. At first there's a strange feeling of anticipation, until spontaneous cheering breaks out as the boys come down the gangway. Each face tells its own story. The 12 months away in the war zones have turned boys into men. 